Our next speaker is Dylan White, who is talking about Riff, uh, the programming designer behind Professor, talking about the cost of magic and what mechanics lead to interesting gameplay and magic systems. We've touched on this a little bit in a couple of different talks today, but like, let's go into that in more detail whenever he's ready to actually share whatever, whenever he's ready. Okay. Take yeah, it you see the uh, you see the slides and everything. Can you hear me and all? Yep, you're you're great. Go for it. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just get started then. Um, yeah, so I'm Dylan White. Uh, I am a roguelike programmer and designer. I recently released a game called Rift Wizard, and this is a lightning talk. It's going to be just 15 minutes long. And the interesting thing about giving a lightning talk is I can't talk about like all of my whole design philosophy. You know, I have to really focus on on one little thing. So I was trying to think what is the uh, What's the most interesting, like hyper specific talk that I could give? And what I came up with was the cost of magic, spellcasting resource mechanics and roguelikes, RPGs, and beyond. So, like, why? Why are why should we talk about spellcasting resource mechanics? Why is this a like a really interesting part of roguelike design? Well, this is what um like in most roguelikes. Your, your turn to turn or second to second gameplay is you're thinking about, do I want to move? Do I want to attack? Or do I cast a spell? And some games have more options, some games have less, but these are kind of the basic options in that you have, um, you have the option to reposition a little bit. You have the option to do a small change to the board, which is what I think of as attack. And then you have the option to make a big change to the game state while expending a bunch of resources. And that's what I would consider spell casting even maybe in a game that wasn't in a fantasy setting, like in a sci-fi game, you might have, um, maybe you call it items or devices or something, but you often have these options that consume a resource and then change change what the, what the game state looks like. And so the resource mechanics are interesting because once you've decided what the game's resource mechanics are going to be, um, it's very hard to, sorry, I'm getting, is everything good? I just got a message. Okay. Uh, once you've sorry, once you've decided what the the resource mechanics are going to be, it's very hard to change them retroactively because you may have designed a lot of you may have designed spells, you may have designed items, you may have designed character skills around manipulating these resources. And so once you've like once you've decided on what they are, it's very, you can have to delete a lot of work if you want to go back and change them. And in addition to that, there there are infinite ways to design your resource mechanics. You can have a mana bar, you can have cooldowns, you can have uh, cards, you can have different, and all these different, you can drill down further into these decisions. Like you can draw one card every turn, you can have a mana bar that regenerates really quickly. Uh, like there's there's no limit to the different, the different ways that you can allocate resources to the player. So I sat down and I, I tried to think about like, what are the, um, like what are the most important things about resource mechanics? And I came up with two questions. And I think answering these questions, either for a game that you're playing or for a game that you're designing, will tell you a lot about that game. And if you're designing a game, then answering these questions will really shape your game. And so I think you, I, you really want to think about these questions before you, before you commit to something. So without further ado, here are the questions. The questions are, number one, how are your spellcasting resources renewed? And number two, do different spells use the same resources or do they use different resources? And I'm gonna call these renewability and fungibility. So I wanna talk about each one of these and why I think both of these questions are really important and impactful to how, how a game feels. So first of all, renewability. How do you get your resource back after you spend it? Is it easy to get your resources back? Does your mana regenerate really quickly? Or is it, is it difficult? Do you have to find a safe space to rest? Do you have to use a limited consumable that you can only find by, um, by finishing encounters and getting further into the game? And I think there's a big, there's always a big debate over like which one is better. I mean, there are, you'll always hear players asking you to make the resource easier to get. And you'll, you'll also always hear people telling you to make it harder to get. Each, um, each direction for this question has advantages and disadvantages. There's no, there's no like easy conclusion. I think that the way the way this impacts the gameplay of a game is if you can renew your resources really easily, 
you're going to cast your spells a lot. And that's really fun. It's really fun to cast spells in a game, especially a game that has a lot of audiovisual flair. So like a, like a AAA game, like a great example is um, Diablo 3. Diablo 3, not technically a roguelike, but that is the game where that I can think of that is the most satisfying game to cast a spell. It has great particle effects, great sound. There's this really like heavy sense that you are doing something, like you're doing something big when you cast a spell. And so for games like that, it, it feels a little bit bad if you can't cast spells a lot. You feel like you're, you're like missing out on the fun part of the game. And I think like the, the basic thing here is the more you get to like, the easier it is to get your resources back, the more you get to spend them and the more you get to interact with the game and the more fun that can be. But then on the other side of the spectrum, the harder it is to get your resources back, the more you have to think about how you're gonna spend them. And so for a low graphics game, and a lot of roguelikes fit into this category, uh, the game I worked on, Rift Wizard, definitely an example of this. Um, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is a popular example of this too. When it's hard to renew your resources, when it's hard to your resources, when it's hard to get them back, you have to think really hard about every action that you're going to take. So if the goal of your game is to make people think really hard and think really strategically, and you're willing to sacrifice some, uh, like some audio, some, I guess, satisfaction, like some, some look and feel of your game for strategy, then maybe low renewability is the way to go. So that's renewability. Uh, now let me just move on to the next question. This one's a bit more complicated. So the next question that I think is really important is, are all of the different resources in your game exchangeable for one another? Like, is there one big, do all your, does all your spell casting come from one pool? Or do you, do you have many different pools of resources? The extremes of this would be a game where you have a mana bar and every spell costs mana. That would be a game that I would say has high fungibility. And then the other extreme would be a game that didn't have mana at all, where each of your spells just had a set number of charges. And when you cast Fireball, that has no bearing on your ability to cast Lightning Bolt. And this is, this is really important because this dictates how the player is thinking about action selection. This dictates how they're thinking about what should I do now and why. If all your resources are fungible, then what the player is doing most of their time is, say, is trying to figure out, how do I optimize this resource? What's the best thing that I can do with my mana? What is the most damage that I can deal with my mana? What's the highest amount of healing that I can get with my mana, et cetera. Whereas if your game has low fungibility, then the, the player has all of these different actions that they can take and taking one does not preclude them from later taking another. So they'll probably end up taking more different actions. And isn't a game where you take more different actions more interesting than a game where you take the same action over and over? So I thought about this some more. And really the drawback with let, making the player take different actions is now they're not choosing which action to take. So when you're thinking about fungibility in a game, what you're thinking about is, do I want the strategic depth of, the play, of player agency and letting players uh, evaluate a situation and think which tool is best for the situation? Or do I want the gameplay variety of having the player do different things? So there's no clear, an there's no clear answer for what you want, but that, those are the, um, that is the consequence of going in each direction with uh, the fungibility axis. So just to give um, to make this more concrete and look at uh, a couple a couple games and what they do. One game I think a lot of roguelike fans have played is Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. So I like to use that for examples, and it uses an interesting trick. There are two different resources in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. One of them is mana, which you use to cast all of your spells. Very fungible. You can do a lot of different things with mana, and it's very easy to renew your mana pool. You can walk around and you get your mana back after a couple turns. But the other resource in Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is piety, and piety works very differently. With piety, piety is the, um, 
the resource that you use to cast your priest spells, like your miracle, your miracles. And it's it's harder to get piety than it is to get mana. So piety has lower renewability. You you have to the way the game works is you have to please your god in some way to get piety, often by killing the enemies of your god or by taking some action that your god thinks is cool, like exploring the dungeon. And you usually have more than one thing you can do with piety, but way fewer things to do with piety than with mana. And so they use this cool, Dungeon Crawl uses this cool trick where you have these two different resource systems. So you get, you get the benefits of uh, high fungibility and low fungibility in the same game. And that's a very, com that's a very common trick. If you look at uh, game resource systems, you'll often see two resource systems layered on top of each other. Another system which is very popular is um, cooldowns. MMOs are big users of cooldowns, so World of Warcraft uses cooldowns. Uh, Tales of Majael 4 is a roguelike that uses cooldowns. And cooldowns are interesting. You can think of a cooldown system as a little mana bar for each spell. Like each spell has its own mana bar, which is the cooldown timer. It's very easy to renew cooldowns. They automatically renew over time or over turns. And there's zero fungibility with cooldowns. You cannot use the cooldown of one spell to pay for another spell. Um, d and spell charges, that's a zero fungibility. You can't, again, you cannot use, use um, one, one memorized spell to uh, cast another memorized spell in Dungeons and Dragons or in any of the uh, computer RPGs derived from Dungeons and Dragons. Cards are another zero fungibility mechanic, often with high renewability as you're drawing cards. And I have a little bit of time left. And what I want to do, what I want, one resource system that I want to talk about is a resource system that probably exists in your game that you may not even know exists in your game. And that is the implicit time resource. So you can think of time as a resource just like mana or charges or cards or cooldowns because time is something that you have to use in order to cast your spells. If your game is turn-based, then just think about turns instead of time. And time always kind of works the same way. Time is a fungible, uh, highly renewable resource. You cannot hoard time. If you, if you waste your time, you can't put that time in a pool somewhere and use it later. And it, you get one turn per turn, or you get one second per second. You're always renewing, you're always renewing it at a constant rate. And so this kind of snuck up on me in Rift Wizard, because I never thought about this as, as a resource. But in a turn-based game where uh, your actions end the turn, every turn is a really important resource. And it might even be a more important resource than the explicit mechanics in your game. I found in Rift Wizard that there are a lot of spells that people are reluctant to use because they didn't feel like they were worth a turn. And that made me think about the resource system very differently. So the lesson here is think carefully about time and Think about if there are any other implicit resource systems that exist in your game that you don't even realize are there. Anyway, I want to wrap this up. And the um, I don't think there's a takeaway for, you know, your resource system should be this or your resource should system should be that. But I think the takeaway should be you need to know what your resource systems are and you should think about what your resource system is encouraging your players to do and how it how the feel of your game is affected by the cost of the actions in that game. And yeah, that's all I got. Excellent, thank you so much. That was delightful, um, lots of fun, thank hold you. on. Having a lot of uh, crosstalk here in terms of sharing screens, it's fine. Uh, we've got time for one quick question, which is like, what's your favorite style of resource usage and management in roguelikes? What have you found to be really compelling? Well, I'm very biased. Um, of course. I don't mean this as a self-promotion, but it's got to be Rift Wizard, the game I made. <laughs> you make the game you want to see. You make the game yeah, you want I made to play. the, um, yeah. I think outside of games that I made, I would have to say Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. And I would have to say, I would say that the piety system in that game is really, really interesting. You can, um, one but thing do you mean really... you don't ignore it entirely and just play song all the time, <laughs> all day, every day? Uh, for those in the, in, the, in the crowd who don't know, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is a huge traditional roguelike. Sam is the god of chaos who ignores piety mechanics in exchange for 
making your life more interesting because they find it funny. I but, never play Zomp because he has no piety mechanic and I find him to be the most boring of all the gods. I like, um, I honestly, I like Trog. I know Trog is the easy god. Trog is fun though. But his it's abilities, yeah. like it's thinking true. about, you know, when am I going to cast the, um, when am I going to do the summon? You know, this, he has this summon that takes like mm -hmm. a really big portion of your piety bar and its strength is actually determined by how much piety you have. Yeah. So it's like this, um, you're looking at every situation and you're saying like, you know, can I, can I just tab through this? Can I just like mash through this encounter or do I need to like do the thing? And yeah. even just that's that very simple act of resource management, I find very, very interesting and satisfying. <laughs>